Welcome to the Tabernacle. My name is Martin and I'm our student ministries pastor here at the Buckley location and I am thrilled to be here with you this morning. I just want to say uh, if you're anything like me, the last few weeks have been, man, a little bit difficult. The weather cooled back down there for a minute and personally I just needed something to be excited about. I got to tell you, I'm one of those people, I'm always looking out a little ways at what's the next thing that I can get excited about. And I know what your question is, because it, it's everybody's question. It's the question we all want answered. It's when are we going to be able to get back together and worship the way that we used to? When are we going to dot, dot, dot? And I got to tell you, I'm the student ministries guy, if you didn't catch that. They're not going to let me tell you that answer. But I will tell you that if that's the question that you've got, like so many of us, hang out, stay involved, watch this message, because we've got a little bit of information for you today. But I want to share with you a story because I think it's not all about when and how quick, but I think there are some things that we are, can hear about how amazing things have already been. See, I've got a friend that shared a story with me last week about a gentleman that's been in his home throughout this process and hasn't been able to watch the services. He doesn't have internet. He's just not as connected. He's not watching it on a big screen TV and he doesn't get all the comforts that so many of us enjoy. But when he found out about it, he took it upon himself to start loading the messages onto an old iPad. And then he took those iPads and he delivered them to his house. So this gentleman is watching a couple weeks old tab services, but staying up to date, staying involved and staying connected in a way that I couldn't have imagined would be something we would have to do. See, I think that this tells us that not only do we have some responsibility and opportunity to stay involved, but it gives us a picture of how it can be and how we can be creative in the midst of all this weirdness. So for me, that was an encouragement. And I hear a lot of those stories, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for proving that a church isn't made out of a building or walls or brick and mortar, that it's made out of amazing individuals moving by God's Spirit. That's a beautiful thing. I want to thank you for those of you that continue to give faithfully in all the different avenues that we can, whether it be on the internet, uh, mailing us checks, whatever you're doing to keep this place moving through financial giving, because that's a huge part of how this plan works. Thank you so much. And I just want to encourage you, if you were tuned in last week, you saw something new. As John was at T77, he asked you to go ahead and get your paper Bibles or your Bible app on your phone and dial in as he was going through because we didn't have the words on the screen. And we love that thought process. We love the idea that so many of you have a Bible in front of you during the service. So we want to encourage you today, do the same thing. Dial in, grab your Bible, and get involved. We love you, and I'm so glad that you're here today. Welcome, Tabernacle family. So glad you are tuning in with us here. Uh, why don't you mouth the words along with us, because you're probably not going to sing, but if you want to sing, sing along, or just mouth the words. Victorious. 
victorious you are the only king forever almighty god we lift you higher you are the only king forever forever more you are victorious Because he lives, let's sing that together. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome by the power of his blood.
love that song because it reminds me of the uh, old song, the, uh, I think it was a Gaither song, actually, that says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. That's where that bridge of that song comes from, because I know he holds the future. And so whatever happens, whatever comes uh, before us, we know that, that we have hope and uh, we can rejoice because of what Jesus has done. And we can see that in our lives time and time again, that, um, that when it seems all hope is lost, when it seems like we can't find a single way out of it, that there has always been Jesus. We can look back at those moments in our lives. Uh, I've had several. I think about the, the day that my sister-in-law died of cancer. And remembering the feeling of Jesus being there with me. And all through that week and through the funeral and even afterwards, we still see Jesus in all of those times. And and to see all of the stories that have happened since then. And um, out of tragedy, we can always look for hope because of what Jesus has for us. And so maybe you're going through a difficult time right now. Maybe you don't understand why we're in this whole thing that we're in right now. But if you look around, if you really look. We find Jesus. It's said that uh, worship is just looking for Jesus and, and finding Jesus in those spaces. And so we get to worship because we know that there was Jesus. And we can look back at our life and see that there was Jesus. So we're going to sing this song that says just that. So would you sing with us? Every time I try to make it on my Every time I try to stand and stop to fall All those lonely roads that I've traveled There was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be couldn't see it then, but I can see it now. There was Jesus. In the way, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, And a price I couldn't pay I'm not perfect so I thank God every day There was Jesus There was Jesus In the way, in the searching In the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Yeah. 
Welcome again to Online Church at the Tabernacle. Uh, my name is John. I'm one of the pastors, and we appreciate you uh, joining us again. We are back this week in Buckley in T2, and uh, we appreciate everyone who has uh, been dialing in, watching our messages. A special shout out. I haven't done this in the past couple weeks, but uh, for those that are in the Manistee County Jail, uh, we remember that you're a part of our church. We pray for you, and we want to especially welcome you. Um, but if you're not in jail, you're somewhere else, you're welcome as well. And I, I wanted to share something uh, before we get going today in our series in Ephesians. Actually, two things. Uh, number one, if you don't have a Bible, uh, we'd love to get you a Bible. Please contact us. We'll do our best to get you a Bible. But most of us have access either on our phone, on an app, the YouVersion app, uh, or online. Uh, but I will not be putting the words again on the screen, even though now we have a screen. We'd like to encourage you to get into your Bible. The second thing I want to say before we get started is the sun is shining again a little bit here in northern Michigan. And uh, just this past week, uh, I had to go to Traverse City. It's about a 20-minute drive for us uh, where we live. And I had some errands to run. And my wife, who as many of you know is online, uh, somehow she got news that Gibby's Fries was going to have a food truck open at a place called Chum's Corners. Now, if you're not from northern Michigan, don't panic yet. And if you don't know where Chum's Corners is, that's okay. And if you don't know what Gibby's fries are, well, I'm about to inform you. Gibby's French fries, uh, these little food trucks show up at fairs. Uh, they show up at the Cherry Festival, at parades, all during the summer. That's a big part of the northern Michigan kind of native experience. They have ridiculously good French fries. It is like a carbohydrate overload. I don't know what the secret recipe is. I know it involves potatoes and fries, but you can get it with whatever seasoning they put on. Uh, you get it with vinegar. And my wife was craving, she's always craving Gibby's fries. So when she found that out, she sent me a text. She said, John, we need you here at home to stop by uh, the food truck and pick some Gibby's fries up for the whole family. And so we're texting back and forth as I was running my errands. And the last text I got from her is that there were four orders for large fries from Gibby's fries. And you know, I wanna bless my family. They're in the middle of quarantine. And let me tell you, if you've never had Gibby's fries, they're a blessing to you, right? They, they, they just bless every part of you. They bless your hips. They bless your belly. They bless your cholesterol big time, right? And so it was my last stop, and I pulled into the big home store where the Gibby's Fries food truck was. You'll never believe what I saw. I saw Americans who were desperate for Gibby's Fries too, in fact, it was, it was kind of cool, but at the same time, it was very disappointing. I, I tried to click a picture of it. In fact, if, if you want to see this picture, I know it's not the best picture, but I was driving. Now, don't, don't turn me in. I wasn't driving on a road. I slowed down in a parking lot, got the phone out. But this is the picture. And outside, way off in the distance here, this is the Gibby's Fries food truck. And there is a line of people, I don't know if you can tell, but this line stretched that direction and it wrapped around here, one window open. I counted over a hundred people in line at one window to get their Gibby's fries. These people were willing to wait. None of them that I could see were sad about it. None of them were like, oh, this sucks, this is the worst. They were talking. Some of them were not even six feet apart. A lot of them were. These people were right here. But 
It was like a big reunion. It was like a miniature fair or festival right there because the sun was out, there's Gibby's fries, and these people were willing to suffer in order to receive that blessing. I took that picture and I texted it to my wife and I said, I love you guys at home, but I've got work to do, right? Apparently, uh, uh, ministry staff were essential workers. I had stuff I had to do that day. I could not stand in that line for four large Gibby's fries. Well, what does that have to do with Ephesians? I'm glad you asked. In fact, if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to turn uh, to Ephesians chapter 3, which is where we are in our resurrection series. And, and like I've said before, we called it the resurrection series, starting not just in Easter, but from 2,000 years ago, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is continuing to resurrect lives. My life, your life, our lives. The power of the resurrection, there's a ripple effect, there's a domino effect that goes on and on and on. Now, there's two parts of this message. The first part, we're going to deal with the first half of chapter 3 of Ephesians. And I encourage you to turn there if you've got a Bible or flip there on your phone. But the second part, I'm going to talk about the tabernacle's quarantine plan from here on out. And hopefully by the end, you'll see how they fit together. Because it has everything to do with suffering in order to receive a blessing. Now, I know some of us might uh, say, well, quarantine isn't that bad. Well, but there's some other people that quarantine, it, it feels like suffering, right? And, and, and it's not suffering compared to what some people in some countries are facing. I mean, really, in the United States, it's not that bad unless there's someone in your family or you personally are, you know, have contracted the virus. But for most of us, maybe suffering's too big of a word, but it has taken us out of our comfort zone. And for many of us, just like those people that were desperate for some Gibby's fries, and to be honest, I don't even think it was about the fries, they just wanted to be in line outside with other human beings. That's the same kind of suffering that we feel and we're feeling, whether you're a child, a teenager that doesn't get to be with his or her youth pastor or you know, at a student ministry or adults that can't meet in groups or probably most importantly, come together on a weekend and worship. Well, I think there's something for us right in here in Ephesians chapter three. So Paul starts by talking about the mystery of God's plan. What is God doing? What is God doing in 2020? In the midst of all of the COVID-19 and the coronavirus pandemic, what was he doing in their lives? What has he been doing since the beginning of time? He gives us a little peek here and then we'll see if we can apply it. Verse 1, chapter 3, Ephesians. It says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And get this, he says, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now I want to pause right there because sometimes when someone's reading it and, and we're not reading it together, we can kind of get lost in those things. Paul reminds them again that he's suffering and he's suffering for the gospel. And he's suffering because he is revealing the mystery of the gospel to other people. And this mystery of the gospel is simply this, that God has had a plan since the beginning of time to resurrect us into new life with him. And it's not just for Jews, and it's not just for Gentiles, it's for Jews and Gentiles together in this new thing called the church. That's the mysterious plan that God has had since the Garden of Eden. And it's all the way up into 2020, and all the way through the end of time on this earth and for all eternity. Verse 7, he goes on. He says, Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. 
To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he's realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. And he closes this section like this. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. It's our glory. So there we see the words like suffering and we hear words like blessing. But let's break a couple things down. Is, is, is Paul is reminding them that he is a prisoner and Paul is reminding them that they are suffering and that he is suffering. But he's also revealing again this mysterious plan and it's a big plan. It's the plan that God just didn't resurrect Jesus from the dead. He's inviting all of us into that resurrection story. In fact, I think there's a couple things that we can apply to our lives, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, whether you were invited to watch this or you didn't really want to watch this, your parents made you, it doesn't matter. Paul is saying, and what I believe the scripture is saying in these verses is that God can resurrect my story. God can resurrect my story. What do I mean by resurrect my story? Every single one of us has a story. We have a past. Uh, we we're born into a certain family or, or you know, maybe we had uh, a nuclear home where there was a mom and a dad and siblings and it was uh, the American dream with a white picket fence. And for some of us, it wasn't that dream. Maybe it was, you know, there was hardship. Maybe there was abandonment. Maybe there was abuse. Through our choices, good and bad, those impact our individual stories. But we all have a story of how we got here. And I believe what Paul and what this scripture is teaching us is that no matter what your story is, God can resurrect your story. So for you, for me, that's a truth. God can resurrect my story. If you've been here uh, through the last couple of us, you know, weekends as we've been looking at Ephesians, that's been what the scripture is telling us. That God resurrects our identity. That he resurrects our purpose that he resurrects our perspective. He gives us something brand new. And, and this chapter right here begins by summarizing all of that through the example of Paul. Did you catch what Paul said? He said, to me, this mystery of the gospel was revealed, although I'm the very least of all the saints. Now on the face of it, I, I probably wouldn't consider Paul the least of all the saints. He's kind of a big deal. He was an apostle. He's somebody that God appeared to. Jesus Christ appeared to him on the Damascus road. He's a guy that God endowed the ability to perform miracles. This is a guy where everywhere he went, he's planning churches, leading people to Christ, starting either riots or revivals. He writes most of the New Testament. And yet Paul says, I'm the very least. I'm the very least. And I believe Paul's telling us that, not to be falsely humble, right? He's not one of those guys that go, oh, no, not me. Paul was aware that God used him mightily 2,000 years ago. But he calls himself the least because Paul understood his past and how God had resurrected his past. If you read through the scriptures, if you read through the book of Acts, you find that Paul wasn't always an apostle. Paul was anti-Christian. He was a legalist. He was a rules guy. I imagine that Paul was a guy that was really kind of hard to be around because he was such a rule follower that it wasn't good enough for him to follow the rules. He had to make sure everyone around him followed whatever set of rules he decided was most important. Have you ever met someone like that? That was Paul, right? But God resurrected his story of being anti-Christian. We've said it before that Paul was virtually a terrorist. He persecuted Christians. He had Christians thrown in jail. He pursued them. He chased them down. He had Christians killed. But when he met Jesus, his story was resurrected because God can resurrect my story. 
Now, I don't know what your past looks like, but whatever it is, God can resurrect your story. Maybe you're someone that says, well, my story is not that bad. I was kind of born and raised in a Christian home, and I'm just, you know, I'm a teenager just trying to do right. I don't get in trouble getting good grades. What do you mean? I don't need my story resurrected. Maybe your story is a little bit vanilla. Well, sometimes uh, vanilla can be a little too vanilla. If your story isn't like, uh, uh, you know, one of those wow stories of, man, can you imagine how bad that guy is? If your story is vanilla, God can resurrect that too. God can take boring lives and make them exciting because God is in the business of invading us with his power, his love, his grace with Jesus and resurrecting stories all the time. God can resurrect my story. We also see how God resurrects the stories of both Jews and Gentiles and everyone in the world. In fact, the story of the Bible from beginning to end is how God in his sovereign wisdom chose to save people through this gospel plan, this mysterious plan that he's been telling since Genesis, all through the Old Testament, all through the New Testament, all the way to now. Right in the middle of that human history, he sent Jesus to be the answer for Jews, Gentiles, for every race, for every different language, every nationality, every background, and to bring them together in the church. Part of his mysterious plan is that all of these followers of Jesus, all of these believers in Christ who are saved by his grace would be called the church. He's resurrecting stories all the time. That's why here at the tabernacle, our vision statement is simply that, changed lives, changed lives. Oh, we're a church, make no mistake of that. We're a church in multiple locations. We have two physical campuses and now we have this online campus that seems to be growing, but all of us that call on the name of Jesus, we're changed lives and God continues to change our lives because God can resurrect my story. But there's something else in there, and I, I think this is where we kind of turn this passage to apply to us. Paul not only referenced himself as the least of the saints, but he also said, he reminded them twice that he was a prisoner of Christ, a prisoner for the gospel. Now, that's one of the reasons we believe as Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesian uh, church and, and, and by God's sovereignty also to us, Paul is writing from prison, physical prison. I don't know if it was a dungeon or if it was more like house arrest. We don't know that for sure. But just like we're under a stay-at-home order here, Paul was restricted. Paul was suffering. He had lost his freedom. He couldn't run up to Chum's Corners to get some Gibby's fries. He was suffering, and he was suffering on behalf of Jesus. He was suffering on behalf of the gospel. He was suffering on behalf of the believers to whom he was writing. But look at his attitude in there. He's, he says, I'm suffering, I'm a prisoner on behalf of you. In fact, in the last verse that I read, verse 13, he says specifically to them, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. What Paul is saying is, this suffering is good. God can do something good with this suffering. It really kind of depends on our perspective. Paul had this perspective. In fact, we see all throughout the New Testament when Paul wrote about suffering that much of how we deal with suffering has to do with our attitude towards suffering. In Philippians chapter one, he says that suffering is a gift. Suffering is a gift. No matter what suffering you're going through, if it's a little bit or a lot of bit, the suffering from your past, what you've had to endure, you can't see the future. God says through his spirit-inspired scriptures that suffering is a gift. It's been granted to you to suffer for the sake of Christ. 
Well, you might say, well, I'm not, you know, preaching the gospel and getting thrown in jail. I can see that. I'm just suffering because I have a horrible relationship with my parents. Or I'm just suffering because I've been abandoned or I was physically abused or, or I've been treated. It's a different kind of suffering. No, how we respond to any suffering is a gift. And it's a gift because we have an opportunity, as it says in Ephesians or in Philippians 4, to rejoice in suffering. Basically to endure suffering different than the world. And this isn't just about grumbling and complaining. You know, I've, I've got five kids and, you know, growing up in that house, there's times when, you know, all the, are we there yet? It's on a road trip or I'm tired or stop touching me. And then, you know, dad will explode and there'll be no more complaining in this car. It's more than just that. More than just grumbling and complaining. It's having a perspective that says, what is God doing in all of this? You see, God can resurrect my suffering. God can resurrect my suffering. So if God can resurrect my story, no matter what's in the past, chocolate or vanilla, if suffering's a part of it, God can resurrect the suffering part. God's always working. We love to quote scriptures to one another like God can work all things together for the good of those that love God. What does that mean? No matter what you're enduring, no matter what you're suffering, no matter how badly you've been treated, God can turn it to something good. Maybe not for your glory, but for his glory. Maybe the only glory I see or you see is how I choose to endure suffering. In fact, it says in Romans 8 that when we suffer for doing good, when we suffer for the glory of God, blessing follows. Because God is in the business of resurrecting suffering for his good. He did it with Jesus. Jesus not only died on a cross, he suffered all the way to the cross. Some of the most brutal torture that he could endure and he had to suffer on my behalf and on your behalf. Because it wasn't just dying for our sin, it was to suffer for our sin. In his dying moments, he cries out to the heavens, my God, why have you forsaken me? He suffered so that we could be healed. He suffered so that we could be forgiven. And we see the glory in that suffering. And if God could resurrect the suffering in Jesus, I believe he can also resurrect whatever you have suffered. Or whatever suffering you or we are going through right now. I think it's important to choose how you will suffer. Now, I got to pause here and I just got to admit, this is easier to preach when I'm not suffering a lot than when I am. So full confession, I know this is going to sound bad, but I've confessed it uh, to our leadership team. I've confessed it to friends. I'm gonna, just going to confess it to everyone, right? Quarantine suits me. I like it. I really do. I, I've got a job. I'm still working. Uh, uh, I've got my family. I, I get to see people when I want to see them, maybe on a Zoom, and then, oh, I've got a bad connection, and then all of a sudden I lose it, right? I know that's terrible. It's not that I don't love people. It's just I haven't suffered a lot, which makes this sermon easier to deliver. However, I have suffered just like anyone else. And how I choose to suffer in those moments. What my perspective becomes in those moments. That's, I think, the hint that Paul gives us right here in this passage. When he says to them, don't lose heart over what I'm suffering because it's for your glory. There's faith there. There's hope there. What does this have to do with pandemic? What does this have to do with church buildings being closed and us not coming together? I think that some of us have become too focused on going back to what things used to be and we've lost focus of what God might be trying to do or what God might be allowing to be worked in us and through us to shape us and change us and retell our stories individually how he can resurrect our stories and how he can resurrect 
our suffering in all of this, even though it's not as bad as in other countries. You know that, you know, originally I'm from Haiti and, and the way that country is suffering right now, it's not just a quarantine, they're suffering famine. There's actually Haitians for the first time, and I don't want to talk too much about this because I'll get emotional, that are telling missionaries, I hope I get the coronavirus because it's a quicker death than starving. So I get it. The little bit of suffering isn't that much, but all the more reason to work with God to let him resurrect it. What if God wants to resurrect our suffering? In fact, and this is where, this is that second part where I want to share with you a little bit of what I believe and what our leadership believes God's plan for us, the tabernacle in this quarantine is, is I believe that God can resurrect the COVID-19 story. God can resurrect the COVID-19 story. Now, before we get there, there's, there's one little bit of scripture that I want to read from 1 Peter. Because I think it, it, it kind of encapsulates our approach. And in, in, in 1 Peter, if, if you did find it in the Bible, it's a little further to the right. Uh, it, 1 Peter is 4, 2 Peter, I can tell you that. But uh, um, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. This apostle writes, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Essentially, who's going to hurt you if all of your zeal is aimed at doing the right thing? Doing good. Verse 14, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Even if you should suffer, if it's for doing good, if it's for righteousness, you will be blessed. There's a verse. Now, I don't know about you, but every time we're live together and I ask for a show of hands, I go, how many of you would like to be blessed? There's always four or five that go, yeah. And then there's a bunch of people that are too cool for school. But then I go, oh, cool. Well, you know, and then I rephrase the question and I ask everyone to participate. I've never met someone say, I don't want to be blessed. I would like to be blessed. I believe anyone would love a blessing from God. Whatever shape or form that blessing is, preferably a check, but if it's not a check, any type of blessing, right? There's a verse that says that if we are zealous to do the right thing, to pursue righteousness, even in suffering, we will be blessed. That's why I say I believe that God can resurrect the COVID-19 story. But we got to work with him. I believe God's a respecter of man's free will. He doesn't impose himself. We can choose to waste the pandemic. We can choose in 20 years to look back and say, oh, that was the worst thing. I'd rather just forget it if, if we're still here in 20 years. Or we can look for the opportunities that God has placed in front of us to rejoice in our suffering, to respond to suffering and let him resurrect the story of COVID-19. Whatever story is being told and whatever story you're believing. So a couple things, I've written it down. In my hand, I hold the short version of the tabernacle quarantine plan because I want to work with God in the midst of whatever little bit of suffering this is so he can resurrect the whole story of this thing. Here's the plan. A couple things before we jump into it. And uh, I know I might get texts. I know I might get emails. That's fine. I may or may not respond to them. But the first thing you need to hear is this is not politics. This is not politics. I know people are pursuing it for political gain. That's not my problem. I serve a king and that's where I'm going to respond from. Now, secondly, there's some people that are like, well, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's persecution. It's not persecution. The fact that the tabernacle physically, our buildings are not open is not persecution. Okay? If, if they were saying that everyone can meet but Christians, that's persecution. And now that's a whole different conversation, a whole different plan. But until it gets to that, we're going to look at how God wants to resurrect this. Because it is a pandemic. It is a pandemic. And I know people will say, but how many people die of this or die of that? I get it. But this is something that has fraught with so many unknowns that we need to be responsible. Scripture teaches us that as 
staff members, as pastors, as board members, that we are shepherds and under shepherds of the flock that God has given us. What do shepherds do? Shepherds lead the flock. Shepherds feed the flock. Shepherds care for the flock. They tend for them. And even if you don't have the virus and you think that you're immune and all of your kids are immune too, well, maybe we're not trying to protect you. Maybe we're trying to protect someone else from you. Again, there's so many unknowns. We're trying to do the best thing for everyone. Some people have said, well, is this the end times? In fact, I've got messages, John, is this the end times? Well, we've been in the end times since Jesus ascended into heaven 2,000 years ago. So yes, we're in the end times. Is this the, the first groans of anticipation of the second coming of Christ? I hope so. But I don't know, and I'm not going to uh, waste a lot of time and energy looking towards that because Jesus himself said no one knows the day, the time, or the hour when he's coming back. All he said was be ready. What if this pandemic is an opportunity for us to realize again, the time is short. And as scripture says elsewhere in the New Testament, to make the most of the time. That's what I want to do. I believe that's what we should want to do. And finally, before I outline the plan, it's important to remember that the church is not closed. This church has never been closed. It's just the buildings that are closed. And what the quarantine has done is it's pushed all of us out of our comfort zone. There are things that we found out as a staff that we have a capability to do that we weren't doing before the pandemic. And we've had to adjust. We've had to have God resurrect old ideas and resurrect things I said I would never do. TV preacher, there, there, I said it. You're welcome. But God's resurrecting my story and God's resurrecting our suffering and God can resurrect the story of COVID-19. So what's the plan? Let me hustle. First part of the plan is what we're doing right now. I'm calling it online church. So we're already in this part of the plan. Online church is what we're doing. It's what we're going to continue to do. We think that uh, we're, we're, we're working out all the kinks and we feel pretty good about being able to put this service online. And I know you can come on and skip to just your favorite part. You can skip the preacher or you can skip the music or I don't like that song and forward. That's between you and God. That's between you and God. But online church is what we're doing right now where you can tune in and get the service when you're ready, either live when it's dropped at 9 a.m. on a Sunday or you can go back through and do online church. And what we're seeing right now at the Tabernacle is over 4,000 people on average are watching these services. Now I know some of those people go to different churches or some of those people are just bored and they're just watching a lot of different church services. That doesn't matter. 4,000 people. We went from a church of somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 to a church of 4,000 on average. That's God resurrecting the story of COVID-19. He's already doing it. The question is, are we going to get on board with God? Secondly, with this online church, our giving, I want to thank you again for our giving. We give to this church too. Our giving is strong. Now, we don't know how it's going to be next month or in six months, but right now our giving is strong and God is blessing. We're doing okay. He's resurrecting the story. There were people that said uh, the tabernacle couldn't afford to have our doors, our physical doors closed for very long. Oh, God's proven them wrong with online church. So we're doing that. What's the second part? The second part, the second phase, and this is news for you right now, it's news for all of us, is home church. It's home church. And this is the challenge. This is what I'm asking you to do because we believe this is one way that God might resurrect this COVID-19 story. It's no secret that uh, more and more people just come and go on Sunday without ever really participating. Home church allows us to engage and participate in a way that we never did before. I am asking you, wherever you are, whether it's here in Michigan, whether you're in Oklahoma, whether you're watching from the south of England, I am asking you, 
to ask God who you should invite into your home safely, responsibly, someone who's not at risk, someone who doesn't have any symptoms. Who could you invite into your home to do home church together? Now I know because I've, I've been at this church for almost 17 years or a little bit over, I can't remember, but there's a lot of people, no, I could never do that. Why? Because we'll be pushed out of our comfort zone. Because I might have to get to know somebody. I might have to articulate my faith. I might have to have an awkward conversation and invite another family for dinner. But can you imagine what that would look like if churches within the tabernacle family sprouted up within homes because just normal people said, hey, we've got high def. Don't watch on your phone. Come and watch on our flat screen. And I don't care if who you invite is people that you're already in a small group with. That'd be great. Or maybe they're a neighbor that doesn't know Christ at all. Or maybe just kind of has is, is been away from church for a while. What would it look like if all of us were to take the challenge and say, I'm in. I'm going to invite two to three families to join me. Again, safely, right? No one at risk. You know, be smart, do social distancing. If you're outside, maybe invite a few more. It doesn't matter. But we believe that that's phase two forcing us to engage with one another, I believe, the way Christ intended. In fact, if you listen to the message last week, you heard me talking about one of the beauties of the church is that until you engage and participate as part of the church, God can't do things in you that he would otherwise have been able to do because you're a law unto yourself. You just, you're, you're like the guy at the drive through church. Just give me my order and maybe I'll come back. And if you're really good music, I'll tip well. But what if we were forced back into relationship? And what if that's one of the things that God wants to do with COVID-19? This is so important. I, I had the privilege this past week to be on a Zoom conference call with 16 pastors from large churches all north of Buckley. They were mostly from Traverse City and then the Tabernacle, right? Representing Buckley and Manistee. And, and this was on everyone's lips. What does it look like to do home church? And maybe, not just from me, not just from our campus pastors, but from lead pastors from all of these other churches are saying, this is an opportunity to go back to something better. Something where people know one another by name. And we know the stories that God is resurrecting. And we're able to support each other in our suffering so that suffering can be resurrected. That's phase two. Home church. Home church. And I'm encouraging you to do that for next week. No matter what the executive orders are, no matter, do it responsibly. They say, you know, ministry people are essential staff. If anyone gives you a hard time, just say, I'm the pastor of this home church and we're doing this responsible and we wiped everything down. There, I'll take the heat for that one. Home church, here's, here's the third phase. And this one has a question mark, limited church. Limited church, I don't know what that looks like. Yes, I, I, I know people have suggested, well, we could have 50 people or less come to the Manistee campus or the Buckley campus. Do the math, people. Even if those 50 people came together in a limited church setting with protocols and masks and, you know, can't have coffee and you have to sit apart, no one can sing. You can't sing because singing apparently is more dangerous than coughing or sneezing. I don't know if that's something we're going to do or not. I, I don't right now, I don't feel like it is. I think what we're doing with online church and home church has more legs and more opportunities. Now, we might do something limited. I don't know. I have to let the staff sort that one out. But maybe we'll, maybe we'll do some type of an event where we can all come together outside. That's no promises. Last but not least, big church. Big church. And I, I don't mean big as in, you know, bigger and better than everyone else. I'm just saying bigger than your home church. There's going to come a time, I believe, where we can all come together as a body, multiple services in Buckley, multiple services in Manistee, and we can worship together where you can hug somebody's neck, 
where you don't have to wear a mask, where you can sing for the glory of God. And we're gonna celebrate. How cool would it be if we'd already begun to experience how God wants to bless us because we chose to work with him even in the midst of our suffering for his glory and for our joy. So that's the plan. I know there's a million and one details. I, I, I don't know all the details. But I know that there's an opportunity. And I know that if you will agree to be in, I think that's step one to God doing something beyond what any of us could ever ask or imagine. Are you in? Is the question. Are you in? In fact, this week, uh, we've been asking you to respond no matter what platform you're on, whether it's Facebook or, or if you're watching on Vimeo or on YouTube, wherever you're able, if you're in, would you send us that message? Even if you don't know what it looks like yet, even if you don't even know if anyone will accept your invitation, would you just let us know? If you're in, would you just say, I'm in? If God wants to resurrect this suffering, if God wants to resurrect the COVID-19 story and he wants to use me as part of the tabernacle, whatever that looks like, John, I think you're straight crazy, but I'm in. Would you just write that? Would you just send us that message just so we know? I'm in. I'm in. And if you need a couple days to think about it, that's fine too. Take a couple days and then come back. I'm in. Are you in is the question. If we endure suffering, and we're zealous to do good, zealous to pursue righteousness, there's blessing. There's blessing for you. There's blessing for us. There's blessing for them. I wanna be a part of that story. I wanna be a part of that story. So I'm done. You know, there's a great song uh, that uh, I've asked our band to sing. So I hope you won't dial out. I want you to listen to the words of this song. The song is called The Blessing. And it speaks to how God is able to not just bless you, but to bless your family. And through a domino effect of the way we respond together to bless generations. Thanks for being with us. God bless you.
His favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and the children and the children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and the children and the children. May His presence go before. Thank you so much for joining us for service today. We love you, we're so glad that you're dialing in, and it's my prayer today that you are all in. When John challenged us today, we each had the opportunity to decide what we're gonna do with this. I don't know what yours will look like, but I'm thankful for it. Take care, have a great weekend.